Art Junkies presents Weld Wednesday with AWS. Brought to you by the American Welding Society. And now your host, Jason Becker. All right, joining me once again for the start of a new year, 2023, is Gary Kanarska with the American Welding Society. Gary, welcome back to the podcast. I know we we chatted last year about the state of the welding industry, and I thought, what better way to kick off 2023 than to kind of do the same thing and see what we've done in 2022 and what we can do in 2023 to advance welding. Yeah, thanks for having me again, Jason. It's such an honor to be here once again. Weld Wednesday's going strong, so looking forward to kicking off 2023 in a good way. Yeah. And if, if 2022 was any indication as to where we're going to go in 2023, I think we're off to a good start because I know uh, Fabtech in 2021 was a much smaller, uh, much smaller conference or much smaller event because, you know, a lot of the big companies didn't show up. A lot of people were apprehensive about traveling. And that I think that kind of also reflected on the industry with supply chain issues and all that. But then going to Atlanta this year, it was massive. It was like we didn't skip a beat. And I don't know about you, but I got back from Fabtech, man, and I was exhausted. And it was only, what, a three-day event this year. Yeah, man, you're you're so right. So Fabtech 2022 in Atlanta was a huge hit. I like to describe it. The vibe was just fantastic, right? I mean, the people that wanted to be there, I mean, they just were dying to be there. 2021, I'll call it a little bit more of an intimate show. I would say that those uh, suppliers that did exhibit at Fabtech 2021 actually had an amazing bad tech because the people that were there were there to buy and they were there to find new technologies. 2022 brought back buyers, um, future looking students. And I mean, the show floor was just hopping the whole time. I mean, I didn't get a chance to walk around that much. You know, my experience at Fabtech is far different, I think, than the average person. But the little bit I did get to walk around the welding areas, the welding automation areas, they were constantly, the aisles were full, demonstrations are going on. You saw live arcs. You know, I'm a huge fan of seeing the live arc, right? Because then that's kind of like really seeing it in action, not just watching a video. I could do that at home. I'm going to Fabtech to see things live in living color, touch it, feel it, smell it. And it was just an absolutely great event in 2022. Yeah, I was, I was super busy the entire time. I mean, I was on the show floor most of the time. So I got to see, you know, like how busy it actually was. You know, guys did a lot of time over the AWS booth. We did a uh, a couple of live panels with uh, CWIs, and then we had some of the influencers with Instagram. You know, we did two separate events over there, uh, and it was it was a great turnout. I mean, I thought you know it's it's like we never stopped. So it was a really good indication. You know, and I think that kind of reflects directly on the industry. The industry's picking back up. Supply chain issues are uh, somewhat you know healing themselves. It's easier to start getting products and everything. Now what we got to worry about is the the cost of fuel because shipping and you know all that stuff's going through the roof so that's that's a whole new problem you know that I don't think that's going away anytime soon but yeah Fabtech 2022 Atlanta Georgia was I think it was a huge success you know and and we talked about it last year uh cobots and robotics and automation coming in to be a, a major player in our industry you know we we spoke pretty in depth in the uh you know last year's episode and you could see that, you know, right there on the show floor. It was like every other booth had some sort of cobot or automation, you know, right there on the on the show floor. Yeah, I mean, it's really clear that, you know, clever robots are here to stay. You know, I think I mentioned last year, you know, I was not a believer in the beginning. I'm obviously a believer now. And the cool thing is, you know, not just the variety and the number of people that had cobots, then you had startups, right? Startups that actually are making a cobot in the United States, they made it for material handling and they recognized, wow, this welding area, we should adapt our cobot to do welding as well. So it's kind of another entrant into the marketplace. But again, having this variety and options uh, of people you can get a cobot from is just critical, mm -hmm. right? The amount of support you're gonna get locally, you know, the ability to, to get supply of those. And so it really was something that was, was really uh, prevalent throughout the show. Yeah. Just going back a second, you know, you admit you had said the word influences earlier. I want to just highlight that because, you know, there's been people that have been influencers within the welding industry for a number of years now, right? But I think at Fabtech 2022, the the impact the influencers had was, was a little bit different than what we've seen before. 
There was more in different booths. They were moving around. As you highlighted, there were a number of kind of get-togethers where a number of the different influencers came together and drew kind of their followings. Um, and, and taking those opportunities and seizing this moment where there is momentum to people be interested in welding, to have these really great personalities, and I include yourself in that, to really be able to out there and advocating for welding and entering welding, exploring welding, looking at all the different aspects. I mean, I think it's something that really is kind of coming into its own and a lot of reasons for that, all the different social media platforms. But I think also allowing the venues for people to continue to engage. And that's why Fab Tech is so critical, right? It, it's a platform for people to come together, look at some cool welding stuff, but more importantly, meet their industry peers, ask questions of people that are going to give them a straight answer, not some cookie cutter uh, manufactured answer that meets all the requirements. It's kind of the real story. And that's the beautiful thing about when you get to Fab Tech and get all the people together, I mean, you can get the real skinny, right? You can actually get the information the way you want it from the type of people you want. And that's the entire gamut of what you've got to offer. So I wanted to thank all those that came because I really do think it added another element to it. You know, we had a number of different events where they also attended, you know, and they added, again, another kind of layer of excitement to everything that we hosted. So, you know, my shout out to all those that are advocating for welding uh, and continue to, to do that and help out the future of the welding community. Yeah. And it, I mean, it was great to see everybody because we always, I say it all the time, FabTech's kind of like the, uh, it's like the family reunion, right? And I, I remember at one point, you know, when uh, 2020 happened and it was, you know, we, they decided not to go through with FabTech and, you know, they wanted to do like a virtual FabTech. And I was like, oh, man. I, and there was talks about just making FabTech a virtual event every year. And I was like, man, please don't do that, because as human beings, we need that physical person to person connection. And you're not going to get that, you know, via Zoom or Microsoft Teams or any of that. You, you, you're going to get, like you said, the real story, raw and uncut, unfiltered right there, person to person. You need that contact. And like you said, you know, all these the influencers on social media and stuff, you know, they they're inspiring more people to get into welding because it's it's a trade. It's a craft. It's a profession. We're all truly passionate about everybody that was there. They're not putting on a facade. They're not putting on a front. I mean, they're out there doing live demos, getting people into a skilled trade that we're truly passionate about. So, And it's awesome to see that, you know, happen in real time you know, to see those connections being made and, and people, you know, meeting the uh, the folks that they follow on social media, you know, that they've been inspired by and just to hang out and chat with them and, and have access to that person, you know, one-on-one -on -one for a little bit. I, I think FabTech, you know, it, it creates that environment and kind of fosters that growth for our industry. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you think about, you know, go back into the, you know, it's, it's almost funny to talk about the pandemic anymore, but, you know, welders were essential right? Fabrication operations, yeah, they may have closed down for a few days when kind of, you know, everything was hitting the fan, but they were back to work and they were keeping America going, Yeah, right? And so I think that's just part of the fabric of who we are, is that person to person. I mean, and I, I never was a big fan of the virtual. I mean, we hosted it. We had some good virtual events, but in the end, right? I mean, you get some good information out of content, but it's about those connections. And then that ability to reach out to somebody a week later, a month later, a year later, that you build those types of networks and those relationships by being in person. And so, you know, I'll never forget how, you know, welding was deemed essential. I like to think American Welding Society helped a lot of the smaller manufacturers. You know, when we sent out that letter in support of how essential welding is to the fabric of America. Uh, and, and again, I think welding and op manage, uh, manufacturing responded. Right. And that kind of looks, you know, looking towards 2023, there's a lot of uncertainty across the broad economy, but manufacturing still got a fairly robust short term outlook, a little bit better than some of the other sectors. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, everything you interact with on a daily basis has been touched by welding in, in some, you know, form or fashion. Even when like the country shut down for two weeks to, to flatten the curve, you still had people out there that were labeled essential. A lot of them were welders. I was getting calls as an educator saying, hey, if your students aren't in class right now, we could use them down here running this process, that process. We can put them to work right now. And I mean, half my class was working during the pandemic or, you know, more. I mean, the ones that wanted to go out and, and, and make some money because they were deemed essential. You know, so they were out there working and, and trying to keep everything going because demand didn't slow down. Sales on uh, 
on Amazon were going through the roof. <laughs> you know, it's because people are at home buying stuff. So that stuff still has to be built and manufactured. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as as you highlighted, that ability to kind of deploy that next generation and get them some on the job training, right? I mean, that's just kind of like life lesson, you know, trial by fire type of stuff that really is just a fantastic way for someone to kind of grow within the industry. And again, the fact that we have that ability, that it is a skilled trade, but again, this is now going to go back to the advocacy. You know, we need manufacturers to be mentoring and their tutelage, you know, bringing the next generation in to do some simple jobs. Let them be helpers, right? Whether that means that, uh, you know, you formalize that through something like an apprenticeship program, or you do something where it's just, you know, you have them come in after school for a few hours and let them absorb and be around the manufacturing process, you know, those manufacturers that are begging to find the good people, but then aren't engaging with their local community and bringing in students or people looking for a career change to get them exposed to it. It's kind of like, that's one of the, the critical arrows or one of the things in the tool belt you got to be using is engaging people by bringing you into your facility. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, it, I'd get calls from employers all the time. They're like, Hey, we need a, we need a welder. Well, I can send you somebody that just went through the program. They've got a pretty good grasp on the concepts but it's going to be up to you to show them and, and direct them into, you know, the widget that you're building specifically, the skill sets that they need. So I would talk to them all the time and say, hey, you know, if you guys have an apprenticeship set up or you have like on the job training or an internship, I can fill that completely. Like you said, you know, these manufacturers, people in industry, if you want to start bringing in skilled labor, bring in some students from the local Votech, put them in, you know, like a like a small task, you know, something that they can kind of learn on the job, put them with, you know, one of your lead welders or lead fabricators, bring them in there, let them learn, mentor them. And, you know, they'll become valuable employees, dedicated employees, like show them that you need them and then provide the support for them to get additional training. Because at a welding school, you can only teach them so much. I can't take a group of 15 to 20 students and skill them up enough in, you know, 20 to 30 weeks to work in any different aspect of the industry. I can give them the basics, the fundamentals, blueprint reading, tape measure reading, weld symbol interpretation, all the different processes, but you need to show them the application. You need to show them, you know, here's how we do it here because you're going to have access to different equipment that I, I simply, as an educator, I don't have access to that. So bring them in, skill them up, and they're going to be, like I said, they're going to be valuable, dedicated employees, but you got to give them that opportunity. For sure, for sure. And actually, one thing that happened is, is, you know, we continue as AWS to focus a lot on the shortage of welders, right? And that's something that we will never stop focusing on, you know, as, as part of our core mission, right? And so, you know, some of the initiatives we launched in 2022, you know, we, we put together a, a new website called weldingapprenticeship.com. And that actually came out of a request from one of our member uh, organizations that was saying, look, I can't hire enough welders. I need a longer term solution. You know, I've heard about apprenticeships. Is there any way that AWS can help me understand apprenticeships? And that was kind of like the catalyst moment where we're like, you know what? Here's yet another opportunity for AWS to give back to the welding community and try to create some guidelines of how do you go about coming up with a registered apprenticeship program? And so again, this is something that, you know, I don't have all the details. I encourage you to maybe look into those further, but you know, this was our opportunity to help employers and help educators come together to create formalized programs of how to bring in welders into your organization. So apprenticeships have been around for forever, long before welding was ever something, but this is something that is very strong in the union side of, uh, of manufacturing, but the employers of some, some size should be able to implement these themselves. And so we've created some guidelines for them to be able to do that. I think that's great. I mean, I actually sat in on the uh, the webinar that uh, Scott Elmsworth and Joe Young did for the apprenticeship program. And I was like, finally, because that's one of the things that I'm like super stoked about is apprenticeship programs. I went through an apprenticeship program when I joined the Iron Workers Union. And at the time, mm -hmm. I didn't understand the value in it because I was like, young, dumb, and full of ambition. I was like, I know everything. Why do I need to go back to school, you know, and but I went through the apprenticeship program and I got 
all these certifications to be able to do the things that my employer required of me. Uh, signalman, welding symbol interpretation, blueprints, like all this stuff that you need as a young journeyman welder that was provided for by the union through an apprenticeship program. And I'm not saying like go union, go non-union or whatever. That's that's going to be somebody's individual choice. There's there's advantages and disadvantages to both. But I do think one of the big advantages of you know the unions is the apprenticeship. They bring people in off the street that have absolutely no skill sets whatsoever when it comes to welding or fabrication or, you know, pipe fitting, fabrication, uh, ironwork, all that stuff. And they they start teaching them from the ground up and you get documented certifications. Whereas, you know, a lot of, uh, in, you know, folks from industry, different companies, they don't provide that training. They just expect you to know everything they need you to know when they hire you on. And you might learn on the job and you might learn on the job from somebody that they don't really know either. Yeah, I mean, you highlighted two apprenticeship programs, one in particular, the iron workers. You know, AWS has been proudly partnered with the iron workers for almost two decades now. You know, another one, SMART, the sheet metal, air rail, and transportation workers, another great apprenticeship program that AWS is very proud to be a partner of. And so we wanted to extend kind of what those models, which are hugely successful, and help others out that, that are looking to add that apprenticeship in, because you're right, it gives you a different level of skills. You talked about scaling up, right? They have the formula of how to scale up a person to be a productive iron worker or sheet metal worker. And they've really done it in a professional way for many, many years. So I can't, I had to give a shout out to those two partner organizations because they do a tremendous job of preparing welders for the industry. Yeah. And, and I mean, like I said, you can come in knowing absolutely nothing and you're you're gaining certifications as you go through. So when you go to these different job sites, it's required of you to have like an OSHA 10 or an OSHA 30. I got that at no additional cost to me, no out-of-pocket expense through an apprenticeship program. Now I'm certified to work on that job site or welding certification that's recognized internationally. I could go in and certify in my local hall and now I'm available to go work on all these different job sites. So, I mean, it's it's all about documentation. And you earn that, you earn those different credentials through an apprenticeship program. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where, you know, the AWS Certified Welder, which is a very specific program, but that AWS Certified Welder, which you get through either accredited test facility or through a partnership like what we just spoke about, really is what they call a national, portable, industry-recognized credential, right? It's really one of the only credentials that has a national registry that if I'm get my certified welder in Florida. I could go to a job in Oregon. They could go into the national registry on AWS's website, type in your cert number and actually pull up what your certification is, right? And we provide that to give the flexibility to the welder to give them that opportunity to be able to travel and go to where the work is if they're in a place where there isn't any, which currently still knock on wood, there is a lot of welding jobs anywhere you are in the U.S. You don't necessarily have to hit the road, but there's obviously benefits to doing that. Oh, yeah, especially if you hit a shutdown. And I mean, most likely, I mean, it's like you said, it's a transferable certification. Most likely, once you get to where you're going, you know, they're, they're going to pull that up and say, OK, you've you know demonstrated that proficiency at one time, but you're going to have to go ahead and retest for us because of the, sure. you know, the owner's engineer or whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, you're like, oh, OK, I just have to do the same test that I just passed you know, six months ago. Okay, no problem. I've got the proficiency. I've got the skills. Yep, absolutely. And you're correct. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, this is like where like my vision of utopia in 20 years, right, is where that certified welder is so recognized where when you walk on that job and you've got the right certification based on the welding you need to do there, because, you know, you can't just be one size fits all, exactly. obviously, but that they truly are where you can just go right to work. Because you, could you imagine the savings to the welding industry if we didn't test every single welder that came in for a job, mm -hmm. right? I get why we do it, why we do it, and this is why I say it's like a twenty-year type of vision. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we could have where you bring in welders, you put them to work, right? It cuts out a lot of cost, time, right? And at the end of the day, with good quality assurance systems, it doesn't take you long for a person to come in and see, hey, that card, that person cannot do what that card said, right? You know, and, and you can you can kind of resolve that issue right there on the spot. But, you know, long-term, if you could just think about, you know, go to a big shipbuilding area, right? Every single welder that goes in the yard takes a weld test. 
and they're hiring 10 at a time, 25, 100 at a time, the number of weld tests going on every single day in the welding industry is a phenomenal number. I fully understand why, I get it. But if we were to start thinking more forward, how do we make that a more efficient process long-term? I think AWS can play a critical role in that. Oh yeah, if you think about it, welders are probably the most tested profession in the world. I mean, think about it. Welders are tested more than doctors, more than lawyers, more than any other skilled trade cuz like like we said, you know, pretty much every job you go to, you've got to take a weld test to be able to, you know, to be employable. So I mean, you yeah. think about it. I mean, every welder, I mean, you're going to do hundreds of tests, you know, throughout your entire career. It's the most tested yeah, profession most tested profession in the so world. So spot on, man. So spot on. I mean, that's one of the things when you think about, and I think this goes to kind of the U.S. strength and how we approach quality and safety, right? Is, yeah, would you want to take the person's word for it? I mean, I personally would, but at the same time, there's a lot of liability associated with those welds that are being made, right? And so the way that we've got the systems built is to provide the highest quality and safety to the industry. But you're right. I mean, the number of times a person will test through their career is phenomenal, right? And again, I think it's just a testament to the quality of the industry that we're serving. Yeah, it goes back to the old adage that, uh, you know, somebody will tell you, oh, yeah, I've never failed a weld test. Well, you obviously haven't been in this industry long enough because if you've taken <laughs> enough weld tests, you failed one at some point. For sure, for sure. And so I've, I've failed my fair share of tests, but I mean, you you learn from that, you know? But yeah, I think, I if, mean, you know, having a, having a database to be able to go through, and then uh, that also helps with quality assurance. Because, you know, if you're an inspector and you're out on a job site and you see something fraudulent, I, I just had uh, another inspector that I had on the podcast previously, he was talking about, you know, having the ability to pull somebody's cert. Well, typically, you know, if they just get certified by Joe Blow down the road, you know, and they the, you, the inspector pulls their certification, that, that welder can just print off another one and go to the next job site. Whereas if it's all centrally located in a database, if a CWI files a complaint and said, hey, we need to pull this welder cert, it gets pulled in the database. Somebody's going to be able to see that. Correct. And that, that yep. just helps QA, QC on every single job site after that. Yes. So I know last time we talked, we, we talked about the, uh, the welding workforce data website and, you know, all the different, um, the, the need for welders in our industry. Now have during 2022, did we make a dent in any of those figures? I mean, are we getting enough people in the industry to sustain and have viable growth as compared to the demand of welders? Yeah, I mean, I want to sit here and be like, hell yeah, we made tons of progress in 2022. But the reality is there's just a lot of forces working against us, right? We you know we still continue to challenge, be challenged with the kind of the stigma, the three Ds, right? Dull, dirty, and dangerous, you know, but that's changing, right? When you see things like cobots and you're starting to see those deployed in smaller shops around the world or around the US, I mean, those are a way to attract the next generation that it's not just about welding, it's also about technology, right? But some of the things that we initiated in 2022 uh, as AWS is to advocate for more ways to approach this welder shortage, right? To focus on things like productivity, right? So we launched the lean management. I think I may have highlighted that before. We're kind of reinvigorating the certified welding supervisor program. So we plan on having in-person certified welding supervisor seminars next year and the CWS is focused on productivity, how to improve the efficiency of a weld operation. So if today I'm three welders short, well, what about if I could go and improve my productivity and save myself five welders worth of time, right? I just closed my gap. I just addressed my shortage of welders without hiring any more welders, right? The same way that we're going to continue to advocate for the adoption of automation. As the American Welding Society, that's yet another solution to address the welder shortage. So when you've got easy to implement tools like Cobots, that becomes a lot more of a different type of conversation than the traditional capital outlay, return on investment calculation, all that that used to go into automation purchases is really a completely different conversation today. You know, I hosted a panel at Fabtech uh, on automation. And one of the things we talked about is, you know, the return on investment calculation is almost like not dead per se, but it's a different catalyst today because it's, can I keep the doors open, right? Can I serve my customers in the minimum way that they need me to if I don't automate, right? We talk about reshoring. They want to bring back 
more work to the U.S. from overseas. So again, you highlighted earlier to strengthen that supply chain for the future. Well, if that was being manufactured in a low cost country, you know, manually, well, if you go welder for welder, it's not going to be cost effective to reshore that back to the U.S. So you've got to automate that. You've got to bring technology to that reshoring project. And so there's probably enough reshoring to keep us busy for a long time. But how do we digest that? Right. That's more demand on welders. If I'm bringing more work back to the U.S. I need more welders to weld on that. So that's why we can't just be focused on new entrants to the industry only. We've got to be thinking of other ways that we're helping manufacturers to be more productive. We're helping them to make the decisions on how to adopt automation. Right. So in 2022, we had our first automated welding and sensors conference out in Denver, Colorado. We're going to be doing that again next year, an automated welding conference in October in, I, I hate to say it, Columbus, Ohio, right? What's okay. wrong with Columbus? So, yeah, well, for those that know that I went to the <laughs> University of Michigan, I don't know if anyone saw the score, 45-23, but at the end of the day, next year actually is the 75-year anniversary of the welding engineering program at Ohio State. So for the AWS to have the opportunity to host a conference there in Columbus is an absolute honor to be able to do that. So I say that tongue in cheek. I'm super excited about that, uh, that automation conference in Columbus. But again, that's critical for us to be able to introduce more automation technologies to the welding community. But again, create those opportunities for network to bring the people together to talk about automation, talk about the challenges they face, and to share the ideas of how they're addressing this welder shortage. So that's one thing I would say that we initiated in a much more of a, of a robust way in 2022, is we're continuing to offer more than $2 million in scholarships, offer the welding workforce grants to the schools, the PhD fellowships, but we know that's just not enough. We need to do more for the welding community. That's where productivity and automation is coming into play. Yeah. And, and I think that's a big thing. We talked about that last time, you know, when you're on the episode last January last year is automation is not coming to take anyone's jobs. We still need these welders on the shop floor to be able to program and, you know, teach these robots how to do what we do. You know, the, the welding, the grinding, the cutting. That was the cool thing I saw at Fabtech is not only are they putting welding heads on the end of these robots, you know, they're putting in grinding or grinding apparatuses, you know, so who loves to grind? nobody that's the worst part about being a welder if i can hit a button on a robot and say hey you know go clean that part up for me you know i'm gonna do it so i mean just having somebody in there to be able to program that robot we still need the welder to go in there and be able to do the work and program that robot so it's not taking anyone's jobs it's it's supplementing because we can't hit the numbers to sustain our industry yeah you're absolutely correct i mean you know there's a couple of sayings you said you would you rather train a welder to run a robot a robot program and teach them how to weld. You're I mean, better off grabbing the welder right? and teach them how to program. Absolutely. Then you take that welder, he does a programming, sets it up. You then bring in a helper to actually load the thing. The welder goes, does the custom parts. They go do the TIG welding, right? They go do some fabrication that can't be easily automated. So now you're taking your skilled labor and putting them on the more difficult, more profitable parts. And then you're bringing in somebody at a, maybe a, at an entry level to then actually run the equipment once it's already programmed, right? But no, you brought up grinding, you know, and I, I know you've seen it, but on Instagram, it's like the new guy catching the grinding sparks of the bucket. Oh, yeah. You got to do a spark test, spark samples. Yeah, the spark, yeah. When you when you said that, that's the first thing that came to my mind. I started laughing. I'm like, because you're right, nobody wants to grind. That's like the worst thing on the planet, which, again, going back to that productivity, if I could weld more efficiently with less fatter, I would not need to grind as much. Therefore, I'm more productive. I don't need somebody grinding. I'm not using grinding this. I'm not taking valuable time. So those are the types of things when we talk about productivity that I'm talking about. It's like, how do I make a cleaner weld so there's less post-weld cleanup? What do I need to do before the weld so that my weld goes in first time right every time, right? And so those are the, some of the types of things that we're going to continue to build training around, have conferences, webinars around productivity. Yeah, that was one of the cool things I thought, you know, the, and I know you guys do different events every year, but the uh, the Weld Summit that took place in Houston, Texas this year, that was a lot of fun. I mean, that was like a four-day event. You know, everybody from the welding industry just kind of 
moved into the woodlands in Texas there. And I, I think that was a great event. You know, you had different sessions for, you know, different facets of the industry. The, one of the ones I got to attend was uh, Steve Snyder's uh, presentation on the uh, the certified welding supervisor, which I think that's an awesome program. And I'm glad you guys are bringing that back in person because that's something I want to look into this year because uh, sometimes I just don't have the discipline to sit down with that big owner's book and just go through it myself. But if I could, you know, dedicate a, a week to going on site and sitting in a class and being drip fed that information and having to do the homework, that's something I can definitely do. And that's that's a credential I've been wanting to add to my repertoire for, you know, a couple of years now. I just haven't had the time on my own to do that. But if I can carve out a week to go take that seminar, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> Shoot me a link, Gary. Yeah, for sure. And, and you're right. I, I tell you that welding summit was a huge success. Right. And so that's something that we've run in the past. And that's something we've already got on the calendar 2023, August, back in the woodlands again. Oh, you're doing it again this year. We are doing it again in 2023. Okay. I thought it was going to be a biannual event. So I got to write that down on my calendar. You said August? I think, yeah, in August, August uh, 16th to the, to the 18th. And again, this is the difference between, uh, you know, wanting to go fast. You know, an event as great as that was with the learning, but again, the networking. It's like, how do we let two years go by before we give people that opportunity again, right? And so that's, again, we're, we're running that in 2023, because while it was great in 2022, it still, I think, only scratched the surface as to getting the engagement with the welding community, right? It was good turnout, but I, I want great turnout in 2023. And so you're right, the Welding Summit focused on emerging technologies, you know, different areas of welding. We, we introduced apprenticeship programs actually on it. We, we talked about different uh, um, systems like ITW system of how they manage their, their priorities, right? There was just all these great learning opportunities happening simultaneously. And then again, the opportunity we had a small exhibit area to then network and see some different things. I mean, I met some great contacts there. I keep in touch with even now, you know, at Welding Summit. So yeah, that's 2023 in August uh, as well. Yeah. And I, I think that's it's a great way to do it again in person because you just can't foster those relationships via online. and it's, it, But it's great to get in there, network, and talk to people. Like, I met a ton of people at the Weld Summit. You know, I spent a lot of time over at the uh, AWS Careers and Welding Trailer because we had the student day and everything like that. But, you know, like the after hours things, the you know, those events, uh, the show floor that you had set up and everything. I mean, it was a great time to meet new people in the industry. So I got to meet, uh, like I said, Scott Ellsworth. I got to meet uh, Paisley and Natalia, uh, you know, uh, I got to meet Walt Sparko for the first time. I mean, it was just, it was a great event and you know, that it, it kind of um, opened my eyes to a lot more people that are in this industry, a lot, a lot more of the, the different sectors because you can't know everything about welding, but you can know somebody in that arena that, that does know more. So now you've got that contact. Yeah. I, I, I refer to the, the degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. Six right? degrees of Kevin so, Bacon. Yeah. In the welding industry, it almost seems like you never get further than two. You might have to get to the third degree of Kevin Bacon, but it, it's really that tight of a community that if you know somebody, like you said, they may not know the answer, but odds are is they know someone or someone they know knows someone. So that's why I say the third degree of Kevin Bacon. But that's what's so great about welding, because when you get to that second degree, is that person like nine times out of 10 is willing to help you? Right. I don't think that's like every industry has that willingness to kind of impart knowledge to the next generation, share information. Obviously, people are still tight about proprietary stuff, and it's not like people are just wildly talking about anything. Right. But you're very specific in your ass. Nine times out of 10, a person's going to help you, at least in the welding community. And I can't speak for anything else because I've only worked my entire career within welding. But I know that you know, that's one of the things I love about the welding community is that willingness to help. You know, you mentioned Walt Spurka. I mean, the guy's a legend. Oh, yeah. Right? He's like so a he's Jedi master hosting. when it comes to API, or yeah, ASME Section 9. Yeah, ASME Section 9. So he's hosting these ASME code clinics. I think we did four in 2022. He's going to do four more in 2023. You know, and those are just a huge hit. The, the class sells out every time. We host it in different parts of the U.S. for those four different events. You know, and it's really, it's if you're working to ASME, I mean, you've got to almost attend that thing. It is that popular. The feedback is tremendous. But again, Walt, he's on our board of directors, actually. So he's not only giving back through knowledge, he's also giving back to the welding community by being on our board of directors. Yeah, he's he's a brilliant guy. Like, I took his class uh, for the ASME Section 9 there in October. 
right back at the Woodlands. Okay. And then he was on the CWI panel at Fabtech. So we get to see each other quite a bit this year. It was it was great to finally meet him because it's like you keep hearing about this guy like he's a god. And then you finally get to meet him and you're like, dude, he's everything everybody says he is. He's an awesome guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's for super sure. Super smart. Super smart. Yep. So what are, what are some of the other events you guys have coming out in 2023? Yeah, so the, uh, there's an aluminum event in uh, April in, in Seattle, Washington. But the kind of the biggest event we're having next year is actually in November. And it's called the Inspection Expo and Conference. And I got to read this tagline because it's a great tagline. The only inspections conference created by inspectors for inspectors. So this particular conference is actually jointly sponsored by the American Institute of Steel Construction, AISC, as well as NDTMA, the Non-Destructive Testing Management Association. So there's actually multiple tracks. There's a welding track, an inspection track, and a structural steel track to be held in Austin, Texas. So this is our second time hosting IEC. The first time was January of 2020. So you can think back to January of 2020, you know, a month and a half before kind of everything uh, kind of really went uh, kind of sideways on us. But we tried to host this I guess it would have been like near the middle of the end of 2021, and we just couldn't get it done because of, of COVID at the time. So we're looking that this is going to be a huge event for CWIs, right? So that is the target. So certified welding inspectors or aspiring certified welding inspectors, this conference was designed. The committee is all made up of CWIs. The majority of the speakers are CWIs. And so this is the premier inspection conference for people to attend in 2023. I'm adding that to my calendar right now because I, I definitely don't want to miss that one. If it's anything like the Weld Summit, but it's got that inspection side to it, that, that's something I want to attend because I get to go to all these different welding events and you bump into a couple CWIs here and there, but like just going to an event for inspection, I think that's that's awesome. That's something I want to jump on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it was a great event uh, the first time we held it. So we're anticipating it to be another great event here uh, next year. Oh, that's fantastic. This year. So are we still, is AWS still, I mean, you said we're, we're still dedicated to bringing people into the industry. What are some of the ways that we're doing that now? Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, we've got a lot of initiatives as the American Wellness Society, trying to attract welders to the industry. And so, you know, a number of years ago, there was actually something started called the Skilled Trades Coalition. And so the idea of the Skilled Trades Coalition was to get the leaders of many of the different trade associations, professional associations that are serving the different skilled trades or different manufacturing sectors to kind of come together and brainstorm ideas, share ideas of how we're attracting talent to our particular uh, skilled trade. And so we've now been trying to evolve this thing because as we look out to the landscape, at, you know, who at a national level is advocating hey, come explore the skilled trades, right? Take a look. I mean, there's a myriad of different skilled trades. Naturally, I focus on welding, but I kind of lead the skilled trade coalition at this particular time period. Of how do we get more people, I like to say, at the top of the funnel, exploring all of the skilled trades? And who is that national voice saying, hey, come look at the skilled trades? And there really isn't one, right? There's people that are advocating at a national level to look at manufacturing, Right. Well, manufacturing has everything from engineers to marketing to, to product management to welders to machinists. Right. But what about those that are really focused over here in the skilled trade side? Like, how are we building that particular funnel? And there really kind of wasn't a national voice. There's a lot of great initiatives that are kind of regionally focused and they're trying to build momentum. But because they don't have that national voice, it's just a little bit slow going. So, we're trying to figure out a way of how do we aggregate this information to create kind of a place that a new entrant to a skilled trade or a student looking at that, or more importantly, parents, right? Parents looking at what are options for their kids, that they can go to some place and say, okay, let me explore everything from, you know, welding to plumbing to electrical to carpentry to whatever it is. Okay, let me narrow it down to these three skilled trades that are interesting. Now let me go look at that information at like our careersinwelding.com, right? But to try to get more people interested in just any skilled trades, let me go work with my hands and then let them kind of like divide off into the different areas. Right now we're trying to like almost like a bottoms up approach. Like I'm trying to bring people directly into welding. 
you know, the plumbers are trying to put directly into plumbing. It's like, oh, how do we get people to look at it a little bit more at the top side versus the bottom to say, these are all the different options. Because as I think I highlighted last year, roughly 30 to 35% of high school graduates obtain a college degree, okay? As I talked about before, yeah, we look at how many kids go to college. It doesn't matter if you go to college for one semester, four semesters, six semesters. If you don't obtain a degree, you didn't really accomplish anything. Yeah, you really didn't That's go to college. I mean, you didn't go you to went. college, right? You went. You, you attended just some didn't classes, do anything with it. You burned some money, right? But 65% of college or high school graduates never get that degree. So why are we continuing to focus on the minority, right? And it really comes down to, to us, to you, to me, to the parents, right? So, you know, I'm talking with my daughter about what her options might be. Would I like for her to go to college? Of course, that seems like a good avenue. You know, it's a good experience. I enjoyed it, but maybe that's not the right fit for her. So she's in eighth grade right now, and I'm starting to introduce different types of avenues for her. I introduced her to a welding. Do I think she's become a welder? There's actually a chance for that, but she likes animals. So a vet tech. Okay, a vet tech is a great career opportunity for her. If she starts to kind of lean that direction, she can kind of like tailor her high school experience to become a vet tech. Or maybe she's going to go into cosmetology. Maybe you become an electrician. But I'm already talking to her today in eighth grade that, you know what, you don't necessarily have to go to college. If you choose to go to college, that's great. We'll support you. You've got our full support. But here are other options if maybe that's not the right choice for you. And she's really interested in learning now so that the next four years of high school, she's not sitting in all these classes preparing for her for college when she has no, you know, desire to even no, want yeah, to no go. drive to go. No drive to go. And so it starts inside, inside your own homes, right? And so I'm, I guess, doing a test case now. I've got four more years to see what this kind of evolves into but I'm already advocating with her about what her options are. So she's not going to school and feeling less of a person because, you know, I'm not going to go to college. Well, neither are 65% of your other classmates are going to get a degree anyways. So stick to the majority. And if that's what you choose not to do, you'll get full support from us. Yeah. That's great. You know, determining that skilled trades aren't a plan B, you know I mean? And, and that's the way it's been looked at for, for years. But like you said, you know, only, 65%. I mean, think about the majority of people that aren't going to college, that aren't going to get a degree. Let's focus, you know, some time and effort and attention on that first. You know, put that first and foremost. But I think that's cool that there's an entire coalition just to get people into skilled trades because, yes, we stand up on our soapbox and we talk about, you know, how we desperately need welders, but we desperately need people in all skilled trades, not just welding. I mean, apartment maintenance, uh, you know, industrial mechanics, uh, you know, forklift operators, you know, packing, shipping and receiving, like all these different, you know, trades that keep this country up and running. There's a shortage across the board. So just bringing them in, getting them interested in something. I mean, they might get into electrical or plumbing and be like, you know, this isn't for me, but I see those those welding arcs over there. Those look pretty cool. You know, I might get in then Boom. You know, the next thing you know, they're into welding or they get into welding. And they're like, eh, this really isn't the trade for me. And they become an electrician. Uh, you know, I mean, there's just Bring them in, you know, get them, get them interested, get them excited, let them work with their hands, let them build some cool stuff. Yeah, I heard one thing, you know, I, I can't remember exactly when, it was by Jay Timmons, a president of the National Association of Manufacturing. He highlighted, you know, we've been trying to attract people to the manufacturing sector for many years. But one thing that's kind of changed here over the pandemic is the competition for workers has gotten much more fierce. So now... You look across any sector that employs masses of people, all of them have a labor shortage. And so it's almost like there's a smaller pool of candidates to try to attract to manufacturing, attract to welding. And now we're competing with more tech type of jobs, right? Uh, truck driving, right? Which unbelievable salaries can be made if you choose to go on the open road today. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, any sector you're looking at has a shortage of labor today. So where before we were having difficulty attracting, we had it in a more favorable light where, you know, the in other industries were kind of at full employment or whatever it might be. And so, uh, you know, they were kind of like at steady state. Well, now they're underemployed as well. We're underemployed in manufacturing, specifically in welding. So now we're competing for a smaller pool of candidates than we used to. So I think that's an interesting catalyst 
which again goes back to, well, how do you compete with those other types of jobs and industries, right? And so there's got to be career progression. There's got to be investment in professional and personal development, right? Manufacturers and, and owners of welding operations are going to have to start treating their employees a bit differently long-term in order to attract and retain talent in this new war on talent, which is a much broader multi-front war than it was, you know, pre-pandemic. Yeah. And, I mean, and it's not just here in the States. I, mean, I was up at, uh, up in Cleveland for the world skills competition and I was mm-hmm. sitting next to a guy from, uh, from Germany and he said the same exact thing you know, they're facing a skilled labor shortage over in Germany and, and most of Europe as well. So it's not just, you know, a, a problem here in the U S I mean, it's a, it's a global issue. Yeah, absolutely. And it's global everywhere. Even in the, and I think I've mentioned this before, the most populated countries in the world still have a shortage of skilled labor, right? Because even in those countries, it, it's maybe not the most glamorous role, right? But ironically, in Germany, you know, a skilled tradesperson is actually very well thought of. They're not thought of as less, actually, because yeah. they've got a tremendous technical education program there, you know, that, that you know, is, is phenomenal, you know, but even there, people are not necessarily wanting to enter that because, I mean, it is a little bit harder work than sitting at a desk all day in the air conditioning, you know, working on a computer, right? But you know, you and I would both argue it's far more rewarding than maybe that desk job. Yeah, we got we got to glamorize skilled trades a little bit more. There's there's got to be a way to do it because you talk to any kid, you know, like like your daughter's age, you know, you're talking about 13, 14, 15 year olds. All they want to do is I want to be a professional gamer on YouTube because you can make a ridiculous amount of money and you sit at home and play video games all day. Why would I yeah. want to go out, you know, in 110 degree Florida weather and and play with fire and electricity and melt steel together? You know, when I could just sit here at my beanbag chair and talk into a camera and play Call of Duty, we we got to <laughs> glamorize, you know, the skilled trades a little bit more and, and show people the value in it. And I, I think Absolutely. AWS is doing a great job, you know, kind of pushing that, you know, and, and exposing the younger generation to welding and providing all the different grants and scholarships for them to come in and be able to afford to take these training courses and, and having a list that, hey, once you finish up your your welding program you can go over here to jobsandwelding.com and and you can get you know you can find a job in your area or hey if you want to travel you've got access to that as well because it's an entire national database yeah definitely and that and like i said earlier on i mean that is our core mission that we've got to continue to provide for the future of the welding community and find ways to attract more talent and then find more ways to bridge that gap as i mentioned you know productivity advocating for automation all these things are things AWS is going to continue to focus on as we go forward. Well, fantastic. Gary, it's been a pleasure having you back on the show. I look forward to seeing you at some of the uh, the events coming up this year in 2023 that AWS can be hosting and putting on. Um, all of the, I know we listed a lot of websites in this episode. I'll go ahead and put those down there in the, uh, the show notes so everybody can just click on them. It's a lot easier to find them that way. But yeah, thanks again for your time, and I hope you have an awesome 2023. Yeah, best of luck to you, Jason, 2023. Thanks for having me. Oh, anytime. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for tuning into this month's episode of Weld Wednesdays with AWS. For more information on how you can get involved with AWS or to become a member, you can go to aws.org. I know Gary and I discussed a lot of different links during the podcast, so I'm going to have them all listed out in the show notes section of the episode. Be sure to tune in the first Wednesday of every month for new episodes of Weld Wednesdays with AWS and every Monday for new episodes of the Arc Junkies podcast. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Stay safe out there. And until next time, make every weld better than your last.